Awesome. So here we go, camera 101. Um, we are, oh, I'm just gonna turn, this is like wildly, dis wait, is this wildly distracting? Can you guys see me on the side here? No, hopefully not. Okay, I'm not gonna worry about it, I'm here. All right, class summary. Um, so we're gonna cover how to make gorgeous videos by discussing pre-production, camera settings, framing fundamentals, lighting, and then some gear recommendations right at the end. About me, I'm an Oakland-based filmmaker and photographer. I'm a producer, shooter, and editor, and I make content for mission-aligned clients. So what does that mean? Uh, it means that I'm working with a lot of nonprofits, a lot of small businesses doing cool stuff, and I pretty much uh, run the full gamut of production. So all the way from pre-production, through shooting everything, through editing everything, um, and delivery. So it's kind of nice to come full circle and have my hands in, in all stages of production. And I know we just did a little of this, uh, but I would love to know what you all know. So um, if you wanna answer in the chat and just let me know what kind of camera you're using, um, it's okay if you're using your phone. Um, but I would love to just kind of get a general gauge of what you're shooting with right now. All right, so we have a Nikon D90 and an Oh, a Mia, 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 I'm not sure what that is. Oh, it's a film camera, that's why, okay. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little, I did a little bit of film, but I'm still quite um, a baby to the film world. Um, we've got a Canon camera, an iPhone 6, and Canon DSLR, awesome. Uh, I started off on a Canon film camera that belonged to my dad, uh, and when I started shooting video, was on a Canon as well. Um, we basically already answered that one, so, Looks like almost everyone is pretty familiar with DSLRs. Um, DSLR means it's a digital single lens reflex camera. A lot of them have mirrors in them so that when you're clicking that shutter button, you get that nice satisfac satisfa satisfying click sound and that's that mirror popping up. Um, they're doing mirrorless cameras more and more these days. Uh, and then have you practiced any of the following? So if you're familiar with any of these things, manual focus, has anybody used manual focus on their cameras or even on their phones? Yes, awesome. My stepmother was like just introducing it to me a few we weeks ago. Awesome. A little bit. Uh, manual exposure, has anyone done manual exposure? Probably maybe not so much in this group, and that's okay. Okay, we got a yes though. That's awesome. Uh, the rule of thirds. Is that familiar to anybody? Seeing some nods. Awesome. And a fusion slash bounce lighting. Is anybody familiar with that? Seeing some no's. Okay. Awesome. Well, we're gonna jump right into it. Uh, so before you start, and this is like pre-pre-production, um, always make sure that you have a signed contract if you're doing any kind of paid client work. Just get it in writing, what you're doing, what your rate is, always a great idea. Know where you're going to be filming. So uh, it doesn't have to be super specific, but at least know I'm going to be filming outdoors or I'm going to be filming in an office building. There's a conference room reserved for us, things like that. Prep your talent. Uh, this is actually hyperlinked, so when they send this deck out afterwards, you'll be able to click on that and just get like a blog post that I wrote up about how to prepare your, your talent for getting uh, in front of a camera. And I send that out to people that I work with all the time. Get your releases signed. Uh, this release is also hyperlinked, a little legal disclaimer at the bottom, but you're welcome to use it. Just make sure that your talent is agreeing to appear on camera so you can actually use the footage and you want it signed before you start shooting. You wanna charge all your batteries. This is an you know, obvious one, but um, can be super detrimental if you forget. Clean your lenses, also a really obvious one, but um, I've done it before where I've shot on a dirty lens. So just 
Before I go out, usually when I'm packing my bag, I just do a quick wipe down of all those lenses, make sure they're looking good. Format your cards before you're out there. Sometimes it's easy to think, oh, when I show up, I'll get everything ready. But honestly, it's so much less stressful if you just have that done ahead of time when you're at home packing. And pack for worst case scenarios. So charge extra batteries. If you have access to an extra camera or an extra lens in case you drop one or one doesn't work, pack it. Um, it's always better to have what you don't need than not have it there if you need it. Pre-production. So this mostly is about location scouting. And in order of importance, you wanna consider what the audio is of the location that you're shooting in. Um, this photo that I'm using is actually just a photo shoot. So the audio didn't matter in this case, but if you're shooting with a, you know, a client or with talent, you wanna make sure that you've got a quiet room with a door that can shut. If you're outside, you wanna make sure that you're not next to train tracks or with jets flying overhead check out your audio situation ahead of time. And, and that's pretty much the first priority when you're choosing a location. Uh, the next priority, which is pretty high up there, is lighting. Uh, natural lighting is usually the best and freest of the lighting options that we have. So um, just make sure you've got natural light if you don't have studio lights that you're bringing. And then third most important is the background. So sometimes people get this kind of flipped upside down and the background becomes like the most important thing that they think about first. I always like to think about the background last. Uh, once I know that I have a good quiet location with nice natural light, then I'll think about the background, but it is important. When you're prepping your talent, uh, the first thing people ask is usually what do I wear? Um, and again, this, uh, I have a guide on this that you can look up. You know, the main thing is that you don't want them wearing anything that's super distracting. Small patterns on clothing can cause camera more. So you want to avoid small patterns. Um, you want to avoid clangy, dangly jewelry that can make your audio have lots of sound in it. Um, those are the two big things. You want to review the script and the interview questions with them beforehand, if at all possible. Um, and you also want to review the shooting protocol. So what does that mean? If you're doing a live broadcast, you want to make sure that they know that in advance because they're going to want to prepare for, you know, not having the option to have anything edited. They're going to want to be composed on camera. If you're doing an interview, I always let people know, hey, you can start and stop as much as you want. If you say something that you didn't like, let me know. We'll backtrack and we'll record another take. It's totally fine. I also let people know that if they um, it's not a big deal because and edit all that out and a lot of times it just helps to get them relaxed if they're not thinking about oh I can't say um sometimes they can get even more nervous in those situations and then if you're shooting a narrative piece you want to make sure obviously that they know their lines that they know their placing um, all of that and then telling them where to look so are they looking straight into the camera are they looking at the interviewer are they looking at another talent um, just make sure that they know where they should be looking all right, we're gonna dive into camera settings. So uh, there are a few exceptions to this case. Obviously, if you're shooting native content for something like Instagram stories, you're gonna keep your phone in the normal phone position. But for pretty much every other case, video is shot in landscape mode, and that means widescreen. When you go to a movie theater, the screen is widescreen. Our eyes are right next to each other. We see things in widescreen. So, just make sure you turn your phone sideways if you're shooting on your phone. Um, and then if you've got a DSLR, I just took a couple of shots of the DSLRs that I have here. Uh, shooting on manual mode is your friend in video. So sometimes it's just a letter M, sometimes it's got a camera next to it, but go ahead and throw your camera in manual mode if you wanna kind of play with more of the exposure settings and make sure that the camera's not doing anything that you don't want it to be doing shutter speed. So I'm not going to get too far into the technical bit of this, but for the most part, you want your shutter speed set to either 1 50th or 1 60th of a second. Uh, and basically the only difference between those two is whether or not your camera is set up to shoot at 24 frames a second, which is historically what film was shot at back in, back in the day in Hollywood, 24 frames a second was how fast video was shot. Um, when video moved to digital, uh, that was when 30 frames a second became a little more popular. And so you get four extra frames in there. Things are a little bit more crisp. It's a stylistic choice. You can go with either one. Um, just make sure typically your shutter speed needs to be twice your frame rate. 
um, and you can look all all this up in your in your camera menu settings. Aperture. This is where things get a little more fun and you get a little more creative direction. So aperture is indicated by an F usually in front. Um, typically, you know, ranging in 2.8 to 22. And, uh, you know, that's where it is on the back of the camera. It works like an iris, so it gets bigger and smaller. And hopefully you can see this little GIF, but that's basically me just opening my iris all the way up on my camera. And this is the visual demonstration of what that looks like. So when it's all the way open, you get this nice, big, wide open lens. A lot of light can come in. Uh, when you go over here, you get little tiny lens opening. Not so much light can come in. Um, so you want to kind of consider this when you're working with how much light you have and the other effects that aperture does. So aperture affects the depth of field and bokeh. What are those things? So depth of field is basically the distance you have of how much something is in focus. When you have a really small aperture, or sorry, a really large aperture, 2.8, I'm going to go ahead and throw this little guide up at the bottom. Really large aperture, 2.8, you can tell like the records in the back of the shot are totally out of focus. Pretty much the only thing in focus is, is the cat and this cat dome. Um, this is a little bit more in the middle and then this is an f16 and you can tell like you can you know pretty much see the patterns you can tell that this is a target box a lot of things are in focus um, what we call something when it's out of focus is the bokeh and that's kind of that soft beautiful background that we see here it's what a lot of people want in their images so for the most part the wider you get that aperture open the more you can have that effect in your footage and this is something that um, you know, across photography or video, it's the exact same principle. And when you're shooting video, you typically want to manually focus. Um, if you're letting the camera autofocus, a lot of times the focus is going to hunt. So things are going to go in focus and out of focus. There are a few cases where that's helpful, but there are other cases where you just don't want the camera doing that. So some lenses have uh, AF, MF, so autofocus, manual focus switches on them, and you'll want to switch that over to manual focus. Um, some cameras actually have the switch on it. So here's the back of my Panasonic, has a couple autofocus options and then a manual focus. And then newer cameras have an awesome feature called focus peaking. And so all this blue area on the cat's face pretty much tells me this is what's in focus. Um, and that's, I love focus peaking, but if you have an older camera, you may not have it, and, and that is sad, but true. Um, but if you don't have focus peaking, usually you still have a focus assist, and typically what that looks like on your camera is a little box, and what you'll want to do is place that box um, right over your subject's eyes, and there's a, usually a magnifying glass, so you can zoom right in, get super close, Again, we don't have the benefit of focus peaking, but you can at least get a lot closer and tell, you know, what is soft and what's actually in focus. And you pretty much want to check your focus as much as possible when you're on a shoot. When I'm shooting interviews with people, I will even, I will even check focus in between interview questions um, just to make sure that I've totally got it nailed because it is something that's really easy to to get off, um, especially if your subject is moving around. Um, and if I've got that nice wide open aperture, it also means that there's just a little bit of space that's in focus. Um, if you get some of those really nice prime lenses that get the aperture all the way open to like 1.4, 1.2, it will literally, you'll have such small amount of space that'll be in focus that people's eyes can be in focus and their nose will be out of focus. So you have to just be really, really careful when you're that wide open because it's super easy to, to not have things in focus on mistake. Um, I am getting spam called right now, ruining my presentation. <laughs> Sorry, let me get back to the window I was at. <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry guys, let me, let me try this again. Okay. 
You're doing so. great, Christy. <laughs> Here we go. It happens to everyone. <laughs> I love spam calls. They are my favorite. <laughs> um, all right, I'm going to go ahead and click present. So we go full screen. Beautiful. Okay. So let's get back to depth of field. The blurry backdrop is best achieved by having distance between the subject and the background. So in addition to having your f-stop really wide open, having distance is going to make a big difference. So with this very articulated drawing here, you can see if you put your subject kind of back away from this wall, you can have all of that out of focus. So you know, even, you know, in any kind of room, just don't put your subject right against the wall because, you know, their face may be in focus and the wall is right there and it may also be in focus as well. So if you want something soft, make sure it's far away. Always helps. And if you have a small room, you can create more subject behind or more space behind your subject by turning and shooting along the backdrop instead of straight at it. So Here's an example of a straight on shot, kind of got our subject right in front of those books. You know, it looks pretty soft, it looks pretty good. But if you just turn it to the side, you can see how much more we can throw that out of focus. You literally can't read the titles of the books anymore. So if I'm in a really small conference room, that is usually my tactic a lot of times is instead of pushing someone straight up against the wall, I'll just turn and we'll shoot right down along the length of a wall. ISO, again, I'm not gonna get super technical with this, but um, basically your ISO, you don't wanna, um, well, I'm gonna get into that later. Keep in mind that lower is better. You get less noise. So your ISO usually is, is over here on your camera settings, ranging typically from like 100 to 12,000, depending on your camera. You wanna set it where your exposure looks healthy. So you know your shutter speed set at 1 50th, let's say, and maybe my f-stop is set at 2.8. The ISO, you're gonna to wanna to manually set wherever your, your exposure looks good. And you don't wanna leave it on auto because if you leave it on auto, your camera might be changing it while you're shooting and it can actually put a lot of flickering in your footage, which is just kinda of ugly. So avoid that, set it on number. Um, and the lower, the lower your ISO, the less noise you have. The higher ISO, the, the more noise you have. So you might have seen footage shot outdoors in the dark and you'll notice like the little, you know, jittery parts in the shadows and that's just the noisiness of the ISO. Let's talk about white balance. Uh, I will say most cameras nowadays, you throw it on auto white balance and it does a great job for the most part. But again, you don't necessarily want your camera changing white balance when you're in the middle of shooting something. You kind of want to lock it in at whatever the setting is that it should be. So here we can see outdoor shot. I have it on tungsten and it doesn't look very good. It looks blue. Here's the same shot, shot on daylight mode. That looks much more like what I would expect. So. Uh, this little diagram is pretty self-explanatory. You know, nine times out of 10, I'm shooting on either daylight or shade if I'm, you know, shooting in a room that has nice big windows or if I'm outside shooting in open shade. Um, if you're in a situation where you don't have natural light, um, you've got some, some overhead lighting or things like that that you can't turn off, then you can try either the tungsten lighting, which is really warm. That's like what we see in lamps usually around our houses, or white fluorescent, which is usually what office lighting looks like, uh, very like purple and cold lighting. Um, but typically you wanna lock in a white balance. And if you see your footage looking blue or yellow, it's a key indicator that you've got the wrong white balance setting. Framing. So shooting right at eye level is great, and for interviews we do it a lot. Uh, but it doesn't actually convey a lot of emotion. So if you're working on a narrative piece and you want your visuals to tell your story, don't just shoot at eye level. Um, iconic shot from Titanic, we see a super high angle. I mean, I like, whenever I see the shots, like I feel it in the pit of my stomach. Like you're just like, oh, you get that like sinking feeling. And what high angles do is they make the subject seem vulnerable and powerless. So if your character is experiencing those emotions and you want to show that just by using an angle. This is a, a super simple way to do that. Here we see the alternative. We see a low angle 
and uh, the subject seems powerful and intimidating because they're basically way up there in the air. We get this very dramatic angle on them. Um, in this shot, you know, I think it's a lot easier to identify with what the little girl is feeling, um, you know, coming up to this other character. You can kind of feel that she is feeling the fear from, from just the camera angle that they've chosen to tell the story. And how you fill your frame also tells your story, even without dialogue. So even if you haven't seen these films, um, you can basically figure out what's going on just by the way that they've put the characters in the frame. So here we have a dichotomy of basically seeing foreground and background, two totally different stories happening at once that we get to see at the same time. Pretty incredible. And here, you know, even without seeing this movie, we can pretty much tell that the story is about the girl who is larger in the frame. And so that's another way just to reiterate, like, what, is, what, is, what are the visuals doing to reinforce your story? Hey, Christy, you have a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is, oh. If, if you wanted to pull it up, or I'll, I could also read it too. Just yeah, as, I got it. Oh, you got it. Okay. Um, will the image appear on camera screen the way it will record as far as white balance and aperture? It will get pretty darn close. Um, LCD screens are a pretty good indicator of how things are going to look. Uh, once, you know, if you start doing a little more advanced filmmaking and, you know, you see this in Hollywood a lot, everybody's shooting on monitors. So they've got the cameras out on the set shooting with the characters and then everyone is like behind television screens, the director and everybody, because they want to see it way bigger. And it's a lot easier to tell what's going on if you can see it on a giant TV screen. Um, but yeah, it's a pretty good indicator of how things are going to look. So you'll see right on your LCD screen if you change the aperture. Um, and it, you know, it might actually be easier to take a photo, even though I know you're doing video, or take a video clip and, and analyze them side by side and post. Um, but yeah, shows you what's going on. Uh, so back to framing. So we are going to, so, okay, backgrounds are important. Um, always think about what is behind your story, quite literally. So this is something that's super simple and quick. What I love about this shot is that everything has this, we see these repeating round shapes. The lines are all super straight up and down or, or, or across. Um, even the shapes we see in the lipsticks. Um, it's really well done, even though, you know, this was probably done with little to no budget. Still looks really good and has a lot of visual interest in it. This is when you have a lot of budget and time. Um, you know, literally, it looks like the character is being swallowed up by the wallpaper, by the background. Um, again, just another way to reinforce your story. Now we'll get into common types of shots. So a lot of you probably, you know, we've all seen films. We've got the wide shot. A lot of times that's used for establishing shots when you first see a location or first see our characters. Gives us a lot of immediate visual information about where we are and who we're meeting. Medium shots, kind of, you know, they are what, what the name indicates. Nice medium shot. You can get close and kind of see a little bit more, but still see a few characters. And then close shots, which are great for showing detail, great for showing emotion when you really want to get in there and see what someone's face is doing. Headroom. So this is just kind of, it's an aesthetic thing. Again, all rules are meant to be broken, but for the most part, know the rule before you break it. Um, so this is an example of too much headroom. It just kind of feels off. Doesn't feel quite right. Here we have, you know, similar shot. This is, you know, the amount of headroom that feels comfortable. It's what we're used to seeing. So keep that in mind when you're framing people. Generally, uh, I don't love cutting off the tops of people's head, um, especially if you are shooting on a camera that's got 4K capabilities. You, once you've framed it out of frame, you'll never get that information back. So even if you think you might want to crop in a little bit closer in post-production, don't, don't clip off the top of their head when you're shooting in your camera, just in case, you know, you don't want to do that. And this leads into the rule of thirds and lead room. So I'm going to go ahead and throw a grid up here. And the rule of thirds, you know, again, rule can totally be broken. We see it a lot. Um, if anybody, you know, uh, watches explained on Netflix, you'll see, you know, they use people right in the middle of the frame and it looks beautiful, but 
the rule of thirds is also a way to make things look really nice and feel really natural and centered. So we've got our subject sitting right here at the intersection of the thirds. You can use any of these points. It doesn't have to be this point. Um, just to give your, your subject like a very nice weighted compo um, composition. And the lead room, also, you know, this is also referred to eye line. This is naturally what our eyes do anyways, but we're seeing our, our talent right here look the long distance across that frame. So we're, our eyes are looking at her eyes and then our eyes are following where her eyes are looking. So we get to take in, you know, in the first few seconds of seeing the shot, we, we instantly take in this entire frame here. If she was faced the other way, immediately her eyes would go out of frame and you'd kind of ignore everything on the rest. So try and have your characters look the long way across the frame just to take advantage of all that nice set dressing that you've done. I want people to pay attention to it. And then we get into coverage. Make your editor happy. There's no such thing as too much B-roll. Um, this is true for me even to this day. I've been shooting for about 10 years now and I've never had a case where I'm like, oh, I just have too much B-roll. Like the more the merrier, quite literally. So, you know, here's another few examples of what that means. We've got a nice master shot. This is pretty wide. We can see where they are. We can see they're in a hospital. We see the bed, we see the gown, we see the characters. Gives us a lot of information. Um, a wide close-up. So this is kind of a combination of the of the wide shot and the close shot. We're very close to our character. We can see her expression, but the angle is still wide. So she's close to the camera on a wide angle lens. We can still see she's in a hospital. We've got these nice little curtains in the background. We still get a lot of information about where she is. And then we get a cutaway shot where we're just super, whoop, sorry, we're super close to the detail shot and we can see what's going on in the frame. Um, so just get a lot of shots when you're out there shooting. If you're shooting in any kind of location and you don't know how you're going to get as many shots as you need, I always like to say a wide, medium, and close. And I've got three shots right there, even if, even if it's the same subject. All right, so lighting. Lighting uh, is a little tricky. We're going to talk about natural lighting for the most part. Um, so for flattering lighting, use open shade and avoid direct sunlight. Um, this just makes people's skin look really nice, which people love. So as we can see in this first image, a lot of harsh shadows under her eyes, under her chin, under her nose. Still a really beautiful shot, I think, um, but maybe not the most flattering if you're just trying to go for nice, bright, and even lighting, which is what we get when we get an even, in, in nice open shade. So we can see she's in the exact same spot, She's literally just backed up into that open shade. And actually all that light, we can tell, you know, the light's coming from this way. All that light is bouncing back up onto her face and making that just nice, you know, she it makes the skin glow. So open shade is your friend. And uh, I always like to look for open shade where I'm kind of somewhere nearby the bright sunlight. I don't want to be totally, you know, in a dark, super dark situation, I still want some of the light, but I just don't want the direct light. I want it bounced or diffused. You also wanna turn off the overhead lights because they are super ugly. What we have happening with overhead lights when you're standing next to a window is basically a mixing of color temperatures. So earlier when we talked about white balance and we talked about fluorescent lighting and tungsten, and we talked about daylight. Uh, when they come together, they produce something that the camera like doesn't really know what to do with. And so it's just kind of this, you know, yellow, yellow but blue at the same time image with a lot of dark shadows under the eyes and under the nose. And you can just see the improvements that we just get just by turning those overheads off. So anywhere that you have a location where you've got overheads on, um, turn them off and use that window light and set your white balance to daylight or shade and you'll get a lot better results. And then you want to use a bounce or a fill to fill in the shadows. So these uh, little diffusion, little diffusion bounces are super econo economical. I want to say they're like 30 bucks and they basically fold up into this little package. This is I think one of our favorite things to teach in class in person is like how to fold them up. They take a little bit of 
take a little bit of finagling to get them folded up, but once you learn it, it's a, it's a great skill to have. But you can just see in this little gif, like what the difference is when we use the fill to just fill in those shadows on the other side of his face. It just like instantly lights up. So this is a super cheap, easy way to take advantage of all that beautiful sunlight or daylight that you've got coming in that window, bounce it on the opposite side, on the shadowed side of someone's face, and you've got a pretty good lighting situation without doing very much work. So I highly recommend this tool. You typically want to avoid backlighting unless it's intentional, which people do. So, you know, here, you know, window behind the head, generally not a great idea. You get a lot of backlighting with that. If you just turn 180 degrees, all that beautiful light can then fall onto that person's face, light up their skin, light up their eyes. You get a nice little, you know, reflection in their eyes, which looks really nice, little twinkle. It looks so, so, so much better. This is an example of intentional backlighting. It's also okay if that's the thing you're going for. Just make sure that, um, that that's what you're going for. So typically you have your subjects completely underexposed. They're literally just shadows and we've exposed for the sky and it's a gorgeous shot. All right, so that's kind of the end of the presentation with the exception of my gear. Um, and you know, the best camera is the one you own, it's, or the one you have. <laughs> It's sad, but true. So watch out, you know, like I have a bunch of big cameras and a lot of times they are not with me and I'm shooting with my phone and that's the reality. But if you want to shoot professionally, you want to do some good work, I do recommend investing in a 4K or an HD camera. So if you're shooting on a DSLR, you know, pre, I don't know, when does 4K roll out? 2017, 2016, you probably have full HD, which is 1920 by 1080. It's still, the, it's still the web standard. So, you know, don't let anyone insult you for not having 4K. It is totally okay. Um, and a lot of times I'm shooting 4K and we export a HD file from it. So 4K gives you a lot of leverage. You get a nice crisp picture. Um, it's getting cheaper and cheaper, but HD is also totally okay. If you have access to a second camera, it's always a good idea. And you know, most of this is because A, if you drop your camera or your camera isn't working, it's always nice to have a backup, especially if you've you know, driven a couple hours to get to the shoot or things like that. Second camera can save the day. Um, it also allows you to get a second angle if you're doing interviews. Um, second angles are amazing. Or if you just have like a really, uh, quick shoot to do. Um, sometimes it's helpful in not having to do a lens change and things like that. Lenses. So this gets a little bit more technical, but I'm going to try and boil this down. So I always recommend a wide to medium lens uh, to, sh to start with. Um, wide to medium is great for traveling. It's great for, you know, just very like everyday uses. Um, the joke when we're traveling is like we're always like the lens is never wide enough so you kind of always want to get more in frame when you're doing landscapes and cityscapes but when you're shooting people sometimes you want to get a little bit closer so wide angle is something like a, a 24 millimeter it's not that wide but it's 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 fairly wide 50 millimeter you get a little bit closer um and it's 50 millimeter prime lenses so not a zoom is a uh, they're beautiful, they're very economical. It was one of the first lenses I bought was just like a Canon 50 millimeter lens. Um, they're called Nifty 50s and they come in plastic and glass versions. The plastic versions I wanna say were like 120 bucks. Um, and you can just get some really nice images out of those. And then if you can afford it, a medium to telephoto lens. So those are the lenses that are gonna get us a little bit closer. Um, I recommend between a 50 and 200 millimeter if you're in a situation where you're shooting folks at the back of a room and uh, you wanna shoot someone on the stage, having a telephoto lens is your best friend because you basically don't need to have your camera right up to that stage. You can be in the back of the room. Um, they also just produce really pretty images because your, your focal length and your depth of field is like, you can really make the background very, very soft. You're gonna need a microphone if you're shooting video. Um, I'm pretty sure Real Stories is a whole workshop on sound, 
but it really is to a certain extent, sound is more important than video uh, when, you're, when you're actually making films. And that's because people have such a short tolerance for bad audio. They, people will watch bad footage, um, but when stuff sounds bad, I think it's very frustrating. They don't want to watch it. So invest in a microphone. Um, they come in all kinds, kinds of flavors and prices. Um, and if you need any help selecting one, you know, be in touch with me. But a good microphone um, is what you need to, to produce some, some good video content. And you're going to also need a, an audio recorder. So DSLRs are not built as video cameras. They were kind of ad hoc on, you know, when they came onto the market, I think it surprised a lot of people because video producers were willing to basically sacrifice every benefit of a video camera just to have good picture. And what that meant was that we can get really good picture, but we need to not have audio coming into those cameras. So um, Zoom, not the not this video conference app, but the, the technology uh, manufacturer makes some really nice uh, audio units, H4N, H6. Um, they are great options for just porting your audio in and not having it come through the camera at all. And there are great tools in post-production for syncing your audio with your video. Christy, you have another question. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. My camera doesn't have a jack for an external mic. Do you have some tips for making the most of built-in audio? Um, so built-in audio is tricky. Um, the reason for that is that you're gonna get, like anytime you touch the camera, you're gonna hear it on the microphone. So that is a, is a pretty big problem. Um, they do make, um, but if you don't have an external jack, this isn't going to help you. They do make like these little shotgun mics that mount onto the hot shoe of cameras. And they're just like a fairly long mic. And they come with a, an eighth inch jack that, you, that some cameras have an input for on the sides. And that's a way to at least um, have a microphone that's not built in. So if you are touching the camera, you're at least not touching the actual microphone. And uh, those external microphones are usually on a shock mount. Um, so that might be one good option. Otherwise, honestly, like, um, just getting some kind of audio recorder is what you would want to do. So I know it's like, it's a hard problem to solve for because it does usually inv involve buying some extra gear. Um, and with that, you want some headphones. So you want decent, decent headphones that fit over your ear. Usually, um, these little like earbud things are great for emergencies and I definitely recommend throwing a set in your bag if you have an extra set but you're not going to want to monitor your audio on them because you just can't hear enough of what's going on to know if you have noise on your line or if someone's shirt is rustling you want to have something that fits over your over your ears um, and then I have a question here for indoors are there better conditions for room for room for audio so if you're indoors, um, a room that has a door on it is great. And, um, you know, I will say if you have any windows and stuff, close the windows when you start recording. Sometimes it's a little tricky because it gets like stuffy in the room. And so a lot of times, you know, I'll open up the window in between takes or things like that, but you're going to want the window shut when you actually start filming. Um, but yeah, a door that closes is awesome. And a, a room that has some soft surfaces is also usually key. If you've got a room that's got tile floors and hard walls and not a lot of furniture, you're going to get a lot of echo. And so typically the first thing I do when I walk into a room is I clap and I listen for reverberations. And if I've got a super echoey room, I usually say, okay, let's see if we can find something else. If we can't find something else, and this has totally happened to me before, um, if the client is super insistent on a, on a specific room, like I've literally gone to my car where I've had like a blanket and a big puffy jacket and a towel and like brought those things in. Um, if the client does have any upholstered furniture, like pushing that into the room will just help like absorb some of the sound so that when someone's talking, you're not just hearing echo, echo, echo. Um, okay, and then onto the list, tripod and or monopod. I shot on a monopod for like years before buying a tripod. So it is possible to get away without buying a tripod, but tripod is good investment. Um, you do want something that's going to stabilize your footage. When I first started shooting, it was one of, you know, 
focusing and stabilization were my biggest challenges. And, you know, and probably in no part due to shooting on a monopod because it's a lot harder to be stable on a monopod, but they are super portable, which is nice. So if you're shooting something where you need to run around a lot and take the camera with you, um, having one leg down is a lot easier than having the tripod where you're folding it up and it's kind of awkward and you carry it around. So um, if you can afford both, get both because they're different tools for different, different uh, setups. And then you'll need some audio cables, which is not a fun thing to shop for, but make sure you buy high quality audio cables. If you're buying cheap audio cables, a lot of times you get what you pay for. Um, again, a sad thing to spend a lot of money on, but it's usually worth it in the end. You want good connections and you want good cable. It's typically something that you invest in once and it should last you quite a few years um, if you buy a good one. Otherwise, you just kind of go through cheap cables. So I don't, I don't mess around with cheap cables anymore. Um, a bounce, again, that was that round thing that unfolds and, and, and can bounce light back up on the other side of someone's face. Those are super, super useful. A lot of them are like five in one bounce diffusers. So they come with a zipper that comes around and you have like a white side, a gold side, a silver side, a black side. Um, and then, you know, you can take the cover off and just have a, a diffuser. So those are super versatile. Again, cheap, easy. Power strips and cords. Again, not a fun thing to spend money on, but definitely one of those things that can save the day if you end up in a room with one outlet, um, pack some extra power strips. And I have like one long yellow extension cord that is great. Gaff tape, um, definitely have a roll in your bag. It's just a, a great tool to have for people. If you need to tape a mic onto someone for some reason, if you need to tape off where your camera is, um, gaff tape is awesome. It won't ruin things. It won't, it's not super, it doesn't leave like a sticky residue. So. This is an industry standard, have it in your bag. Extra data cards. Again, you don't wanna run out of data. You don't want to have a card that is corrupt. So just have a few extra on hand. If you cannot afford to buy the super high capacity ones that they are making today, the like 128 gigabytes or 256 gigabytes, um, 32 and 64 gigabytes are totally fine. So. Have some extra ones, even if they're small. Batteries, uh, again, not a fun thing to spend money on, but you wanna buy some good ones uh, that are rechargeable. So something uh, that's got a high, uh, I think it's like an MH number on it. Um, I should totally write a blog post about batteries. It would be really riveting, but Having good batteries makes a huge difference. If you're using a wireless recorder or um, a wireless lav mic, you're just gonna be going through a lot of batteries. So you're gonna want rechargeables and uh, that way you just don't have to landfill a bunch of single use ones. And then filters. Again, this is like a nice to have, uh, but typically for any lens you have, you want to in the very bare minimum have a UV filter on the end of your lens. Um, and that's because if you, Knock on wood, I hope you don't ever drop a lens, but if you do, if your lens lands on that UV filter, a lot of times it'll smash the filter and your lens will be okay. Um, so having a UV, UV filter is like, you know, a $30 thing to just basically safeguard your lens in case you have an accident with it. Um, otherwise, if you are shooting outdoors, it's nice to also have a polarizer lens, which can reduce reflections, can make your skies look bluer, if anybody's got polarized sunglasses, you know, like it's just a really nice, it's a really nice filter to have in bright sun. Uh, and there's also ND filters, so neutral density filters, and they come in all, you know, from light to dark. Um, and those are really helpful if you are shooting in full sun and you want to have that nice large aperture, but you just got too much light you can't have it that wide open because your footage would be overexposed. So if you have an ND filter, you can basically put a pair of sunglasses on your lens and it allows you to open up your aperture wider in brighter settings. It can be pretty useful. And then this is like the catch-all. So 
I like to have these things in my bag, pens, sewing kit, safety pins, lens cleaners for sure, wipes, tampons, pain medicine, SPF, release forms, chargers, or rain cover, etc. If you don't need it, someone else might. So it's always nice to be the person who can save the day. Um, keep, keep a nice little grab bag in your bag if you can. And then uh, these are hyperlinked, so I'll let you watch them in your own time, but these are just some of my favorite YouTube things to watch. Um, this first one, Every Frame of Painting, is an entire series. This guy is incredible. He basically analyzes a lot of major Hollywood films and talks about the visual language of the filmmaking. So just really incredible. I, I really like watching it for just learning about these things and, and having a super visual example put in front of you. And then Mr. W is something that I've showed most of my classes. Um, it's just an example of like a really great ad that has foreshadowing, it has really nice framing, um, just really good visual storytelling. So when you watch it, you know, don't just think about the actual dialogue and the content, but actually look at how they filmed it to reinforce all the feelings and emotions that they're communicating in this ad. Um, and then here's my contact information. So I'm on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Tiny Oak Media. I'm working on writing more blog posts that should hopefully be helpful to everyone. You're welcome to email me at any time. I love this photo of us taping off our cameras at the last conference we shot because it is like the best case use of bright orange gaff tape that I've ever seen. Um, when you get in really crowded spaces like this, people really like to get a little too close to things that are a little too expensive. So this is great. Like people basically, they stayed away from our little taped off area. So <laughs> I'm a big fan of that. Christine, um, we have another last question. Awesome. And I think, cool, we're doing good on time, 4.54. Doing great. <laughs> um, when you delete photos and videos from your camera, does it create more space on your data card? It does. Um, you know, these, these data cards, they last a very long time. Basically what you want to do after every shoot, pull them out of your camera, import all the footage on your computer. I always put it back in my camera and I double check what I'm seeing on my computer with what I'm seeing on the camera. Um, not all of the content, but like the first and last um, shots that are on there. If I've confirmed that they're on my camera and I like hate to say this guys, but I have deleted way too much footage in my day. Um, it is easy to do when you're doing the volume of work that you may end up doing um, if you end up doing this full time. So just double check everything um, and then format it in card or in camera. And I will say you don't typically want to reuse your, your or you don't, you want to reuse these, yes, but you don't want to be using the same card in different camera models because a lot of times that can cause corruption. So, you know, if you have two different cameras, maybe just stick to, you know, this is my, this is my card for my Canon, this is my card for my Lumix, um, and try not to format them in different formats a lot, but always reformat them in camera before you start shooting. Um, a lot of times if you do stick a card back in and it's already got footage on it, especially if it came from a different camera, weird stuff can happen. So you just wanna, it's always good to start with a freshly formatted card. Um, but you reuse these like I've, you know, some of these have been in my collection for 10 years. I'm a big fan of Transcend. I don't know if they do this anymore, but they used to offer a lifetime warranty on their cards, which I did take advantage of this year. So um, as they get older, it's nice that, you know, if you do find the cards with a lifetime warranty, it might be worth spending a little bit more on them because Transcend totally sent me a brand new card this year, which was amazing. So I recommend them. Um, any other questions for me? Again, I'm happy to, I'm happy to stay in touch, you know, online, offline, eventually, if we can ever hang out in person again, <laughs> I'm around in Oakland. Um, but yeah, 